Welcome to Sotaja Historia Podi, and welcome to the first foray of our usually Finnish podcast to the international arenas and the world of English podcasting and video interviews. This sudden jump of genre has become a result of being presented with the unique, unique opportunity to interview today's extraordinary guests about the <coughs> Russia-Georgian War in 2008. Without further ado, it is our honor to bring the, to the podcast Professor Georgi Papuashvili and Professor Irakli Porshitsi from the Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, well, without further ado, please, gentlemen, um, introduce yourselves a bit, what you have been doing and what has been your role during and after the Russia-Georgian War. Okay, cool. thank you very much. So, Iraq, you will start or? Well, I, I would uh, definitely welcome you starting it because... Ah, okay. Now, as you mentioned, we, were, we both work in Ilya State University, but we both have other activities also ongoing. And uh, so just brief uh, bio, biography, maybe, that during the war I was uh, uh, judge and president of the Constitutional Court, so the court was not involved, of course, in military or some other nation activities, but of course we worried a lot about constitutional rights, constitutional issues. Uh, uh, but uh, before I was a part of the government as Minister of Justice and Minister of Environment and Natural Resources, and um, so after my term expired in the court, I joined the US State University and I do some uh, consultancy at the, in the in an international organizations umbrella in different parts of our region uh, in uh, terms of uh, legal and constitutional judicial reforms. Uh, so that's uh, briefly, and uh, maybe Rakli will tell us. That, uh, he had the more interesting uh, positions in terms of uh, uh, security and military issues, especially after the war, as I remember. Well, um, thank you very much for your uh, invitation to talk about the issue, which is of great importance to us. Well, I'm uh, right now. I have two hats. Uh, I'm um, I'm a dean of a law school at Ilya State University, professor of law, and um, I also um, am vice president and the co-founder of the Georgian Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, but uh, prior to that. Um, I served as the uh, deputy head of the Georgian National Security Council, as well as the first head, uh, first um, uh, deputy minister of uh, reintegration of Georgia, the ministry which is uh, in charge of the policy towards the occupied territories of Georgia. During the war, uh, I was helping the government in different capacities. Um, and prior to that, I was also head of uh, one of the agencies under the Ministry of Justice. So that's briefly about my roles, um, and I'll be happy to... Uh, um, answer your questions and uh, go forward with the podcast. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, <clears throat> and Avila, how much is that? Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to our podcast. Uh, from my <laughs> point of view, also. Uh, as Sota and Historia Body is mainly interested in the concepts of war uh, and history specifically, uh, our goal is to relay your expertise and knowledge of the events leading to and during the Russia Church and George and War during 2008. And uh, we are especially interested about the Russian means of influencing these regions in Sikasvili and Abkhazia uh, before and during the conflict and also about the role of uh, different et ethnic minorities in this whole situation and uh, we could actually start by going to the fall of Soviet Union and even before what was the history of Georgia as a country and uh, region in the Soviet times uh, and how was that affecting the situation that eventually <coughs> evolved to war in 2008? 
uh, yes, actually, briefly, just legal, maybe rather related, you know, some you know, political and other contexts. So, uh, if you uh, go back to the history, Georgia was occupied, annexed by Russia first time in 1921, when after collapse of the uh, Tsarist Russia, Georgia, like other countries, like Finland and others, uh, uh, regained independence in 19. 18, uh, Georgia uh, declared independence, and uh, then uh, it was quite successful in terms that it adopted a very prominent constitution, it uh, adopted uh, many reforms, but of course uh, Bolshevik Russia, then communist Russia, conquered Georgia, but historically the pretext was that there was something, the type of revolt against the uh, Georgian government of the uh, some local Georgians, and Russian troops just helped them. It was uh, what we thought uh, in Soviet times in the schools. And uh, when after the annexation and uh, Georgia was one of the formerly republics of the Soviet uh, Union, one of the 15, uh, final 15 at the beginning it was. And uh, then um, in Georgia, like in some other places, the Stalin constitution imposed some kind of uh, 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 like uh, concept of autonomies, autonomy that they created many autonomous republics and especially in small uh, republics uh, saying that uh, if uh, this uh, like uh, to use them when it's necessary to provoke the conflicts and uh, inter-ethnic and other conflicts and when after uh, the process of uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union started and Georgia was one of the first republics to declare the independence and uh, fight a lot for independence at that time, Russia provoked some of the internal conflicts in two regions, uh, in uh, Abkhazia and uh, in Shinwal region, so called South of Asia. And Abkhazia had the uh, status of autonomous republic, and uh, in Shinwal region, South of Asia had status of autonomous region, uh, so with less competencies. I mean, the region had uh, less competencies than autonomous republic. And um, after uh, Georgia declared the independence, uh, they declared also a type of independence, but with uh, Russian assistance. And, uh, but of course, uh, nobody recognized uh, the independence because they were part of uh, Georgia and uh, after the, uh, Georgia, like other countries, uh, were recognized by uh, world, by UN and other international organizations as independent uh, republic countries. Of course, uh, they were recognized, uh, Georgia and other countries were recognized in the territories, in uh, territories uh, in, uh, where Abkhazia and Crimea region were part of uh, Georgia. But uh, then uh, there were still uh, uh, armed conflicts at the beginning of 90s, but it was not officially Georgia-Russia war. It, uh, they called it like internal conflict. But of course, everybody understood that it was uh, Russia involved because unofficially, uh, they were trying uh, to you know, play uh, the role of uh, peacekeepers, but uh, uh, officially, but unofficially, they assisted uh, the local groups, uh, some protest movements, with armaments, with mercenaries, with instructors, but sometimes with soldiers also, but not naming them as regular army uh, um, uh, soldiers. And uh, but uh, uh, Georgia also was not an important part of the world at that time because it was not. Um, so close to Western um, organizations at that time, and so uh, uh, it was not the focus of the world. And Georgia uh, was forced also to somehow follow the Russian rules, the game of rules, and game of rules that uh, to recognize Russia also as a type of peacekeeper in this region. And uh, but at the beginning of uh, 2000, Russia started uh, to behave uh, itself more aggressive. For example, they started build up of military uh, bases in these regions. Then they started to so-called passportization and giving, pa giving passports to Russian passports to the locals. And uh, this uh, to be used as a pretext if uh, the, usually it's not just Georgia in other countries like in Moldova and now in Ukraine, they use this as uh, to claim that I would uh, go to protect my citizens if something happens in another country because they are Russian citizens. So almost all the population, they were given uh, the population Russian passports. So we had the frozen conflicts, but not solved, but nobody recognized these uh, regions as independent, even Russia. But in 2000, when Georgia, after the Rose Revolution, uh, moved uh, 
towards the Western exploration, especially after the revolution, but even before that, Shevardnadze also started to balance and also to make uh, closer ties with Western countries. At uh, that time, Russia, of course, didn't like that. Uh, Georgia uh, was transformed, uh, started transforming into modern society, modern country from a failed state with internal conflict, with a failed economy, with failed governmental institutions, and uh, trying to uh, uh, be cl as close as possible with the Western civilization to come back to this family and uh, uh, openly declare the um, uh, aspiration to join NATO and European Union. And after that, uh, this uh, 2008 war uh, happened. But uh, the pretext was also Kosovo, when at the beginning of 2008, in February, uh, some big Western uh, countries recognize uh, the cost of independence. Russia immediately declared that it will act uh, uh, somehow uh, to, uh, to use this opportunity uh, with their neighbors. And everybody understood that Georgia was the first who would uh, uh, face these problems. And actually, when uh, they started the war and then recognized uh, these two places as independent countries, they used uh, they used it in a negatively like Kosovo precedent. But everybody in the West and everybody recognized that it was very different. The Kosovo was a very exceptional case because to protect uh, from the aggression and ethnic cleansing of uh, local population. In the Georgian case, it was on the contrary. Georgian population were expelled from their uh, places and from the conflict and it was uh, uh, the ethnic uh, cleansing. So nobody recognizes uh, uh, these two regions as independent countries, just about four, uh, four countries, yes, uh, close allies of Russia. And uh, no, none of them are European countries. Of course, it's uh, Venezuela, very big democracy, so-called. Uh, another one is Nicaragua, I mean, who knows? And Vanuatu, yes. Ah, not four, three. Of course, also nowadays Syria as well. And, uh, and Syria, sorry, yeah. I forgot Syria, another also big democracy. So four countries recognized recently just, uh, but Russia tried a lot to persuade other countries, but even their uh, closest allies in the region didn't agree on that. But then they tried to persuade some allies in Africa, in Latin America, uh, because it's uh, they're distant from them and, uh, you know, uh, manipulating with financial other like uh, assistance, they're trying to uh, get their um, consent, but nobody recognized, uh, you know, don't uh, thinking about, of course, European countries, US and other uh, civilized nations. So that's uh, briefly what was the legal pretext of that. Exactly with that. Uh, well, um, I would agree. Uh... We will come back to more details. Uh, I would agree with uh, what George was talking about, the historical pretext and the, the context uh, um, of, of why the, the, the whole thing broke out. I would just add a few uh, points about, I mean, um, why was it in the interest of Russia to follow the, the policies that they did follow after the outbreak of the Soviet Union? Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, Georgia was part of the Soviet Union for quite some time. After the breakup, well, Russia was centrally weaker than um, it became in uh, 2000s. So um, they understood that, you know, since there's going to be kind of uh, a new neighborhood with new independent states, they should have some leverage on the states in order to be able to control or to influence the situation uh, in the neighborhood. That's why they came up with the, the plot of stoking tension and division inside the uh, newly independent states during those times, especially since everyone knew that the central governments were weaker because they were not as consolidated. Uh, economies have been uh, severely damaged by the breakup. Uh, the GDP was uh, wiped out seriously. The governments, as I said, were weaker. The armies were weaker. The, the law enforcement was weaker. And simply the resource-wise, there was a huge disparity between the Russians and the rest of the, um, uh, the states. So Georgia was no exception to that rule. So for Russians, it was important to stoke tension and division inside our country. And of course, they selected uh, the... Uh, the, the two uh, regions where uh, they thought that uh, it would have been easier for them to go forward with it. Why? Because both of these regions were uh, bordering Russia, okay? 
because there are um, there are also other regions in, in Georgia where you have ethnically compact settlement of uh, different minority groups, but these are primarily tied to, to Russia. I mean, the South Ossetia, Tsking Valley region, as well as Abkhazia. But at the same time, we have to understand that um, uh, in Georgia, there are other ethnic groups, groups of living. So what happened in, um, um, in, in the early 90s was that uh, this, um, the local elites were incited and encouraged to um, announce independence. And of course, they started this in uh, the so-called liberation movements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, completely aided by Russia, um, uh, as it was uh, described by uh, uh, Professor Papuashvili. And the major idea was to retain the control, but to call it a, a exact social term, I mean, social science term, it's, it's, it was basically a divide and rule tactic. Okay, so you divide the countries and then you rule them because you have more resources and you are able to control the situation on the ground. So people now started to talk about the hybrid tactics when Russians were using that in early 90s. Okay, they were trying to come up with the, the, the different types of groups, you know, the, the so-called Caucasian, North Caucasian, um, uh, you know, battalions and uh, different types of movements which were trying to aid, for example, Abkhaz in the region or, or South Ossetians. They were also having a very um, um, uh, kind of indirect uh, a tactic of aiding them with ammunition, all types of military um, uh, personnel and instructors. So they were trying to use this unconventional ways or what they now call hybrid tactics to stop those tensions and to change the situation on the ground. But also sometimes where they were directly involved in these operations, Russians were providing aerial support, they were bombarding, they were um, creating safe passages if there was need. Basically, they were doing everything that you need me from a military uh, standpoint to come up with the situation which would change status quo on the ground. One point to make is that um, after the, the war, uh, uh, I mean, these conflicts broke out, um, Georgians were expelled from these uh, regions. So they were predominantly Georgian uh, regions, you know, because they were in uh, the majority of Georgians in Abkhazia, majority of Georgians in uh, South Ossetia Tsikhin Valley region. So these people were ethnically cleansed. So Georgians lost everything. They became IDPs or internally displaced people who now are residing inside Georgia or elsewhere. So these people lost everything. Their property, their lives were lost. There, are, there is only one um, segment remaining inside Abkhazia, in the Gali region and the certain parts of Ochamchire, where the, you still have Georgians, ethnic Georgians. But they are beyond the control of the central government of Georgia. So right now, they are under control of the so-called local satellite puppet occupation regime plus the Russians, because Russians are basically in effective control of these areas. So, um, and, and uh, as, it, as it was rightly mentioned, Russia was always trying to come up with the, the pretexts for any type of development. So they were uh, peacekeepers because of the, the, the uh, agreement which was signed in Sochi, uh, which basically gave source to the mandates of two different organizations in two different uh, regions of Georgia. In Abkhazia, you had the UNOMI mission, which was the UN administered mission. And then you had uh, OSCE mission in uh, Tsikhin Valley region, South Ossetia. In all of, in both of these formats, you had Russia being present. So were officially and formally known as peacekeepers, even though they were never interested to solve the problem that existed. They were always trying to have the problem um, in the same manner it was, just to have kind of minor dynamics here and there, but there were, their, their interest was to perpetuate the conflict in both of these regions. In 2008, it culminated into a, a war which everyone knows now nowadays, and it's known as the Russo-Georgian War or the Russian-Georgian conflict, uh, which started in uh, uh, 
um, in August, on August 7. Um, but of course, the whole evolution of this conflict started way before. Okay, so it's, it's, it's very important to understand that the dynamics have been evolving and going towards this um, hostilities to, uh, you know, for, for quite some time. And, and we can talk about them. But the major rationale for Russia was to stop Georgia the way it was going. Because as it was rightly mentioned by uh, Professor Papuashvili, Georgia was modernizing. Uh, Georgia was a beacon of uh, uh, democracy in those times because democracy promotion worldwide was a, a priority for major players. So Georgia was one of the role models for other countries in the region. So for Russia, that was a, a big problem because they were saying that, you know, we have a sovereign democracies here, you know, we decide what kind of, what type of democracy we would like to have. So if someone is trying to espouse or, um, and, and create a very different dynamic, and also the, the, this model is becoming more and more successful, there should be a stop to that. Prior to the outbreak, Russians tried, uh, tried to strangle uh, Tbilisi-based government by a few means. They had an uh, embargo imposed on Georgian goods. Maybe you've heard about it. So they basically trying to suffocate Georgia because of the trade embargo. So economic levers were used. In 2006, there was also a problem with the energy supplies. Russians have cut uh, the, the gas supplies to Georgia. So, and, and we had to come up with alternative ways. But in spite of this, Georgia remain. They also stopped, for example, uh, the Georgian wine exports, which was a big part of Georgian economy, and Russia was the biggest um, uh, market for for that wine. So they used myriads of methods, uh, which of course add up also to a, a kind of a hybrid tactics to influence the the state level dynamics uh, with, with your um, rivals. So in spite of all of this, Georgia seasoned these shocks and the crises. And in 2008, they basically came up with, uh, the, uh, the, with the plot to come up with the war with Georgia. And of course, what they did was that they improved, for example, the railway logistics when it comes to Abkhazia, they started to um, uh, renovate different bases, the Gudauta base, uh, the aerial base, uh, inside uh, Tsikhin Valley region, they um, renovated few um, bases and um, actually bolstered them and uh, augmented by the military presence. Um, for example, the tank base in Uraganta, um, the Tsikhin Valley base, but also they came up with uh, the forward bases in, in different areas and locales close to the uh, Georgia controlled areas. So they came up with the logistics and then the military preparations. And then in 2008, they actually started to go forward with the provocation. I would very much um, give you a sense that that's very much what has happened to Finland, you know, during the winter war, um, the, how the, the provocation was staged, how the information warfare was used, how the so-called false flag, um, operation, covert operation was used. And there are different dynamics uh, related to that. So we can talk about this as well. Um, okay. I guess our we are now moving to the uh, actual start of hostilities in 2008. So I would like to uh, interrupt at this point because there are some major points we are very interested to hear about your opinions. Uh, you told us uh, that Russia has uh, used these different kinds of uh, soft measures. Uh, nowadays, the buzzwords would be hybrid, uh, hybrid warfare in influencing and destabilizing. Destabilize, uh, English is hard. To destabilize these uh, regions uh, in Abkhazia and, for example, in Sikasvili. I would like to ask, what do you see as the main uh, interests, the motives for Russia to collude in this region? Is it about energy politics? Is it about uh, this oil infrastructure running through Georgia? Or is it about international uh, recognition during the 90s when Russia was 
kind of a recovering from the dip in uh, major powers prestige after the collapse of Soviet Union. W what do you see the main reasons of Russian interest in this region in general? Uh, we don't hear, uh, George, we don't hear. Which talk because of, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, Russia always had the type of interest in the former Soviet territories, let's say, even in the 90s when the Russia was quite weak. Uh, not, but of course, the militarily always stronger than other countries, even neighboring countries. And, uh, but, uh, and always thought that it was a sphere of its own interest, uh, of strategic interest. And also another point was that uh, these countries, neighboring countries, uh, we are not so strong yet and we are not so close, uh, in a close uh, we don't have so close cooperation with uh, Western organizations. And the Georgia, when it started opening the window, that understanding that its path should go to West, and, uh, and when, uh, it's when it started transforming into modern, uh, modern uh, country, modern statehood, it was a very uh, negative alternative for Russia. Because if Georgia, one of the most corrupt countries in the 90s, one of the most failed uh, state with a low economy, with internal problems, with a lot of problems, and Georgia was getting as a uh, uh, very uh, modernized country, open, even Russian tourists, were, when they were traveling in Georgia, they were just surprised that they were traveling in small Europe because infrastructurally, mentally, no corruption, no state services at the European level, even more advanced in some cases, etc. And plus aspiration to join NATO and European Union. If they, uh, if Georgia joined the NATO, it would have uh, some protection field, and Russia would not dare then in the future uh, to play a serious negative role in internal policies of Georgia. And uh, plus, two, the prosperity uh, in Georgia, and second, uh, or, or European Georgia, and third, uh, if it joins this. Uh, uh, international organizations, it would be very bad example for other neighboring countries. Everybody would follow Georgia outside of Russia. And second, it would be a very bad signal in, inside Russia, whereas there, there is no democracy, democratic practices. And what would uh, you say to this society? Why Georgians are different? We had the same past. And why they live in a better condition? Why they have democracy? They have modernized governmental agencies, uh, they live like in European environment. So it would be a bad example. So that's why they decided to punish Georgia, to stop the aspiration and uh, to pursue government change, regime change, how they call <coughs> when a UN representative, uh, US representative UN uh, said publicly that when Minister of Foreign Affairs Lavrov called um, Condoleezza Rice, State Secretary saying that uh, Saakashvili, the president at that time of Georgia, should go and uh, we should uh, provide regime change. And it was, uh, you know, run publicly because they wanted that to change the, this, the path that Georgia was uh, on the right track. So that's why to punish Georgia because it would uh, be, it would have a very dramatic, uh, you know, influence on other countries, neighboring countries and in uh, Russian society also. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, so yeah. about oil, also, it's correct. You actually will add, and uh, you know, transit also issue. Yeah. But so uh, geopolitically, I mean, of course, Russia wanted to make a statement because um, it was those times when basically Russia stopped flirting with the West. Okay, so they wanted to punch uh, above the weight. Um, but also to make others known that, you know, we are here, we are back. So Georgia was the first basically country which felt this uh, materially, you know, like very tangibly. Um, uh, but of course, in general, um, I mean, if you've heard the Russian um, so-called leaders, you know, during those times, uh, you know, there was this Medvedev statement during those years in 2008 or uh, nine, when he said that, you know, he regards the region as the privileged sphere of Russian influence. Okay, that was the one of the terms which was coined basically and denoting that this is the area where Russia has its own 
uh, special interests. Uh, prior to that, to that, you know, as I said, you know, in the beginning of 90s, Russia wanted to use the so-called divide and rule tactics in order to have tangible leverage on the countries in the region. So Georgia was no exception because you had the similar problem in uh, Azerbaijan with the Karabakh, for example, and the way it was handled. There was the same thing happening in Moldova as well. And of course, uh, when it comes to going back now to uh, the 2000s and 2008, Georgia has become a, a transit route and the transit hub for um, energy carriers. So there were a lot of pipelines going through Georgia, the gas pipelines, to, the one gas, uh, big gas pipeline, two oil pipelines. So Russia was seeing that uh, the way Georgia was perceived because it was a democracy, uh, it, was, it was modernizing, you know, it was transforming into a state and into a model which would challenge the way they were trying to develop during those times. But also the significance of Georgia was increasing. So they wanted to stop it. They also wanted to stop Georgia's integration or approximation with the West uh, because Georgia was getting closer with the NATO um, because there was a dynamic, there was a better dynamic with the EU. So they wanted to make a statement. So Georgia was the country which they targeted primarily because it was a, a success case which they wanted to show and demonstrate to, to uh, the rest of the world that that flirting with um, the West is done and now Russia is coming back. Okay, mm -hmm. that's very interesting because uh, after the early 2000s, Georgia has become known from its major investments in liberal economic policies and uh, infrastructure <laughs> rebuilding and the country has uh, been in many ways uh, a good uh, leader in the region with low uh, corruption and all that and uh, functioning democracy. So you're saying that uh, in one way the country was becoming uh, too major player with uh, too good prestige and then in another way Russia wanted to limit the Western influence in this otherwise hot geopolitical area because you have some oil and gas infrastructure uh, running through the nation. So this was the big statement to uh, bigger players than like NATO and Europe and United States to stay out of this uh, region. That's, that's how uh, it sounds to our ears. And in, in our well, it's all of this, uh, all of this coming together. That's that, that's what I'm saying. It, you know, it has been a confluence of these factors, uh, which has uh, basically created uh, the, the the status quo after 2008, when Russia openly um, uh, decided to go uh, to war with uh, with Georgia, and and uh, to punish it. So. Um, Yes, all of this coming together. So because Georgia was uh, transforming, Georgia was a success story because, you know, it was geopolitically increasing its footprint because there was interest, uh, the vested interest of uh, Western powers in the region. And, and the way Russia wanted to make a statement was uh, basically to stop all of that and punish Georgia for what it has become uh, during those years. And uh, you said that this collusion and the buildup for this major uh, armed movement has been ongoing and continuous all the way from the 90s. Uh, this uh, colluding in the local government and political stuff inside these certain regions. Uh, was that uh, correct? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, one thing we have to understand is that both of these regions were uh, controlled by Russia. So they were totally dependent on Russia. So here I'm talking about the, uh, the effective control that they were exercising. And by effective control, I mean the complete 
control of the uh, of the regions when it comes to the military and hard power, uh, hard security. So they had the bases there. They had the uh, military personnel in uh, both of these regions. They also were seconding their um, the, the the Russian nationals to their governments. So basically, uh, the security. Uh, Institutions were stopped with Russians. They were basically the ones who were ma making all the uh, calls. All the shots were called by them. Um, they were also uh, supplying them uh, with all types of uh, necessary uh, resources, including the financial ones, because both of these regions are completely, even now, dependent on Russian transfers. So they are funded, and they were funded by the direct Russian transfers from the Russian budget. So we have to understand that more than 98% of uh, South Ossetia, uh, Skin Valley region's budget is dependent on Russian transfers. They would not be able to sustain themselves without a direct Russian transfers. There is a lesser dependency in Abkhazia, approximately 70%, 65% of money is uh, sent from Russia. And they also have so-called targeted programs, uh, which are basically kind of a social programs and health-related programs of support. But these are not sustainable entities. They will not be able to generate enough income whatsoever to, to be able to um, um, develop or create any sustainable or viable state unit on the ground. So Russia is basically coming up and calling all the shots and they are trying to sustain these regimes. This was like this prior to the war, more so, of course, after the war um, as well. Um, and, and people don't understand, but, but these uh, areas are pretty tiny. Uh, if you look at the Tsking Valley region, South Ossetia, uh, the question is, uh, people think that you know it's a huge chunk of um, uh, land or it's a pretty big, but to, to tell you the, the truth, it's actually um, as small as one of the neighborhoods in Tbilisi. Okay, there are 10 neighborhoods in Tbilisi. So the smallest one is as big as in Valley region. There are approximately 30,000 people living there right now. Okay, there is okay, a seasonal okay. migration, but not more than that. Okay, it can be like, it can vary by 5,000 or so, but just to understand that Russia is treating these areas as power projection units. Okay, so they're using them for basically military and strategic considerations to influence situation here in Georgia, also beyond because by stationing the military uh, hardware in the regions, the aerial systems, they are also able to control the air above Georgia, but not only, also part of the uh, Black Sea. So they're projected. So it's these are the launching pads for Russia and for power projection. In Abkhazia, it's about Black Sea as well. When it comes to Tsking Valley region, South Ossetia, it's also about the the, uh, the Eastern theater, okay? Because you have uh, Armenia here and you have others also being part of it. Okay, so Russians are using it also as a power projection tool for other means. Okay, okay. I believe this is a kind of a, a key subject when we are discussing about uh, the events leading up to the conflict so i think uh, we m should have a short conversation about uh, events that led up to this how is it possible that the budget of these local governments are basically funded from the budget of russian federation how, how is it possible that we end up in this situation what's the history of this this development um, would you like to start, George, or should I continue? Um, you continue, then I will. Okay, great. Um, so, as, as I said, you know, I mean, these uh, entities have been dependent on, um, on on Russia for quite some time. Uh, in in it's when when it been to, already. In yeah, the of course. Prior to two thousand and eight, as well. I mean, that has been the case. But when they actually thought about starting a military phase or the hot phase, as we call, of, of uh, the war, they started to um, um, basically consolidate their military assets inside these regions. They improved the logistics. They uh, came up they, they came up and, and brought better equipment, military equipment. Um, they, they brought also personnel in high numbers. And 
Also, what they started to do was that they started to test international reaction to those ish, I mean, to those developments. So when they saw that, for example, they um, um, bombarded one of the uh, areas inside the unoccupied part of Georgia and, you know, in Tita Lubani, and they saw that, you know, the reaction wasn't that, um, let's say, uh, clear from the West, you know, because there was a, a visit of then uh, Secretary Rice to the region and they did it during those times. And, you know, the West wasn't really reacting, you know, as vigilantly as they should. So Russians always use that as a kind of, a, they have the, the like certain testing operations, you know, to see is the world alarmed? Will they allow us to go forward with the certain actions? So they were trying to test them. So they prepared the logistics, they prepared the military component, and then they were trying to test if the international community was vigilant enough. Okay, so they continued with that. And then in 2008, in the August, there was the Olympics. Okay, the whole world was at the Olympics. All the leaders were at the peace time. You know, it was a it was a message because Olympics is about peace. You know, it, the, the the biggest uh, the the connotation for the Olympics is that you know it's regarded as a, as 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 a, as a peace um, um, uh, related and uh, peace uh, um, saturated with the peaceful sentiments. And when that was happening, Russians started the assault. Okay, so there was a very clear statement that the in, entire international community was paying attention to this huge event, and then. The, the, the war started here uh, in Georgia. And of course, the way they did it was, um, as I said, you know, Russians had the peace, uh, they were so-called peace uh, uh, keepers during those times. So in both of the regions, you know, they had a mandate to, to stay. Of course, they were using this mandate for a variety of reasons. You know, the people, the peacekeepers, the Russian peacekeepers were not really peacekeepers. They were just the ones who were, um, trying to promote the Russian uh, interests in the region, and they were under direct subordination of the military um, staff uh, during those times. So they um, were trying to use those assets, which were part during those times inside the, uh, the areas, to uh, carry out certain operations. For example, in uh, Tsinvali region, South Ossetia, they were shelling Georgian villages from the peacekeepers headquarters from Skin Valley. Okay, so they were for a few uh, days continuously trying to uh, bombard Georgian villages. So Georgian government had to react one way or another because they were seeing that eth predominantly ethnic Georgian villages were basically under fire 24-7, you know, with few interruptions. So they were trying to provoke a, uh, some type of reaction from Georgia. And then there were also some uh, other types of provocations. Uh, the Georgians were part of this peacekeeping battalion. So they were trying to stage a different types of provocations against the Georgians. There, were, there was a roadside bombs uh, exploding when the Georgians were passing this place. So they were using all types of uh, covert operations in order to provoke Georgian response. And then in um on august 7 what happened was that the regular russian army regiments started to invade georgia okay so they didn't have a mandate to bring on a sovereign georgian territory which was recognized by international com community as Georgian territories, in spite of the fact that, you know, the Russians were still in effective control in those occupied, now occupied territories, they started to uh, have Russian uh, regular army regiments coming into Georgia. And that's when Georgia understood that Russians were up for something big. And they had to respond because they were on a Georgian sovereign territory. That's very much what has happened also in, uh, in your part of the world during the Winter War. That's how it has started. Um, I have read it uh, on numerous times, how the Russians have staged the border, so-called border accidents, that there was a shelling from uh, your side, which there was no Finnish artillery in those areas um, that... You know, it couldn't have been done in any way from your side. They justified then 
the entry of Russia into the war and the announcement of the war, then you had to have a territorial defense phase of protecting your, uh, your own country. So Georgia had the exact same problem. They staged this um, um, uh, military provocations. They had, uh, they had Georgian territory being invaded by Russian regular army regiments. That's very important, not peacekeepers. And they were starting to shell Georgian, ethnically uh, Georgian villages. So Georgia had to act. If, they, if Georgia wouldn't have acted, Georgian state as such would have disappeared. So Je Georgia had to fight. Mm -hmm. So, and that's when, um, of course, Georgia started to repel the attack, which was started by Russians. They uh, had to uh, act. And, and then the, the, the hot phase of the war broke out. The hostilities were also the, the, the fact of life then during those times, especially starting from the, the late night on August 7 and on. Thank you. All right. Um, I think before we are going to the actual uh, actual events of the war, we have to, for a second, uh, for a second, take uh, take a step back and look at the at what situation we're right now. So all the world leaders were with their eyes towards the Olympics. There is this conflict brewing in uh, the occupied regions of Georgia, and Russia brings in the regular troops onto sovereign Georgian territory. True. All right. First, they so bring the, uh, the sovereign territory, the troops, and, of course, uh, then there was this, uh, the, the, um, the whole thing now unfolding. All right. And uh, so now we are in the events of August 7th. Uh, this conflict is starting. And uh, could you please give us a rundown of the, um, of the like, quick rundown of the events of this short war? Well, uh, what Russians have done together with the, the local proxies on the ground is that they evacuated uh, the Tsin Valley region south of Setia, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's actually one more um, proof that they were preparing for a war. They evacuated uh, uh, this region, um, the ethnically uh, non-Georgian part of the region, a few days before the hostilities have broke out. So they, they knew from the beginning what they're going to be doing. So the mostly it, the, there were Georgians left in, in, in the um, Tsin Valley region, South Ossetia, and that's why the shelling has started. So the shelling, as I said, uh, was uh, targeted from the, the so-called um, Russian peacekeepers headquarters. So once the operation has started, you know, once Georgians have decided to um, repel the attack, which has started, you know, of course, um, there was the entry of, of uh, uh, regular Georgian um, um, army, you know, there was an uh, uh, artillery exchange, of course, with Russians, and then um, the, the hot phase have um, evolved. Of course, Russia was uh, dominating the scene, you know, after a few day, after this, the second day, because Russians have had also a preponderance when it comes to the aerial uh, theater of war. So the um, the air was controlled by Russians because the aerial defense of Georgia uh, was penetrated. Um, and and um, Georgia basically was wide open for a bombardment from the Russian side. So they started to control the air. Uh, they started to, uh, there was a massive bombardment of Georgian um, um, uh, locations in different parts. Then there was, of, of course, a different theater of war opening up because Russians have entered also from Abkhazia, from the west of Georgia. So you have to understand that the south of Setia, Tsin Valley region, is in the middle of Georgia. So they started the second phase, you know, of, of the the war from the west. That's where the Abkhazia um, uh, basically borders the unoccupied part of Georgia. They also started an assault from the Black Sea because they've uh, forwarded the the, the, the Russian um, navy. Uh, assets to come close to Georgia. So there was a kind of a full-scale attack against Georgia. So 
um, after a few days of uh, after a few days of um, hostilities, actually, uh, Russians have incurred quite a significant losses. So during after that um, period, Russians have started to modernize and take into account of the lessons of the 2008 because they saw that there were a lot of deficiencies in uh, actual combat. So the modernization of Russian army started after the, the lessons of the 2008. But of course, in the end, they prevailed because they were higher in numbers. They had better military assets. They were dominating the air. So Georgian troops had to withdraw. So they withdrew. Uh, some of the assets were left behind, unfortunately, because they were not able to uh, uh, do it in a timely manner. So uh, because of the lives of people were, of course, more important. So the, um, uh, the, the Georgian military personnel had to withdraw. Of course, there was the evacuation of uh, Georgians taking place uh, from the adjacent areas. So basically, Russians soon came to uh, deeper inside Georgian territory, which was beyond the territory of the the, the, the region that were trying that they tried to start war inside, which was the Tsin Valley region, South Ossetia. So they started to control the areas beyond that. And what they did, I mean, if you understand the way Georgia is laid, you would know that you know it, it basically spreads from the west towards the east, and there is the the major highway which connects uh, entire Georgia. So what they did is that. They did that. They entered the deep from the center and they severed Georgia into two. Okay. Mm -hmm. So strategically, they were trying to control the highways, which were very important. They severed Georgia into two parts and Tbilisi was basically isolated during those times. So Russian troops have fortified their positions uh, um, inside Georgia beyond Tsin Valley region, uh, South Ossetia. During those times, what has happened, you know, Georgia didn't surrender. Um, Georgia called for international support and for international help. And what happened during those years was that few very brave world leaders came to Georgia. Okay. There was a Lithuanian, Lithuanian president, Polish president, Estonian president, Ukrainian president coming to Georgia. So when Russians were deep inside the Georgian territory, Tbilisi didn't surrender uh, and the Saakashvili government was still standing and there were people coming in, high, I mean, officials, political leaders from uh, the West to support Georgia. Okay, that was very important because um, you had basically an international uh, presence now in Georgia and if Russians would advance towards Tbilisi, you know, that would... That would be a statement, you know, even a bigger statement. And during those times, they had, I mean, basically the presidency of the EU was in the hands of the French. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are the times when Sarkozy is the president of France. So it was actually a, an opportunity for France, you know, as a president, as, as a presidency of the EU to show um, that, you know, it, it means business. So then there was the, uh, during those times, of course, Sarkozy flew to Tbilisi, it was very important. And um, they started to negotiate, and the, the negotiations about the ceasefire has started. So he had to travel to Moscow and few times to Tbilisi. And that's how basically the, the six uh, point plan or the, the, the ceasefire um, plan was uh, signed. Uh, between us and the Russians, okay, which we have the six points. Basically, it says that you know, it says that you know, it had to cease the hostilities on both sides. You know, the Georgians and the Russians. Then the Georgians have to withdraw back to the the, the places of their uh, the, the place of their uh, uh, dislocation and and where the Georgians were. And Russians had to withdraw uh, uh, to the places of their uh, ex ante ex ante uh, placement, which they never did because they stayed inside the uh, Tsin Valley region, South Ossetia. So, and then of course they had to allow the humanitarian passage of the goods and, uh, you know, to allow the humanitarian work to start. So it was signed by both parties. And there was a six uh, principle, uh, the six article in that uh, ceasefire uh, agreement, which was about the Geneva talks. So this was a Geneva talks between Georgia and Russia, which was uh, facilitated by international players, uh, by the, the, uh, the 
OSCE, by the EU participation, by the UN participation, and US participation as well, together with Russia and Georgia. And um, basically, that's how the, the Geneva format came into place. Then um, the sites have um, been more or less separated uh, because uh, Russians have started to withdraw from deep inside the Georgian territory. It took a few um, days, uh, a week, uh, and but they still remained inside the sovereign Georgian territories in Abkhazia and Srinvali region because these areas are recognized internationally as Georgian territories. So 20% of Georgian territory has become occupied by Russian because they were there against the will of the sovereign, which is the Georgian state. George, uh, maybe you want to add something about the legal um, points when it comes to the occupation and um, also oh. the territorial integrity part and the, the principle of inviolability of borders, which is violated by the Russian presence and etc. Okay, I will add something, but if you have questions, maybe together I will answer and I will also add uh, to the legal side of the... Um, no, like, well, like, please, please do, uh, okay. do tell um, about this I side also, because... Point, yes, about uh, this uh, so-called Sarkozy-Medvedev agreement, uh, I would add that uh, um, it was signed by Georgian president, by Russian president, and uh, by, uh, but uh, as uh, Iraqi mentioned, uh, uh, Sarkozy acted not just as president of France, but as a France holding chairmanship of the uh, European Union uh, Council. And uh, unfortunately, this agreement just partly uh, has been fulfilled. And uh, Russia still uh, did not uh, fulfill, uh, has not fulfilled its obligations. And uh, first, that uh, it did not withdraw its troops before uh, the war line. So its military bases are in territories which crossed Georgian border after uh, conflict started. And the second, also, it did not allow international humanitarian other organizations uh, to monitor the situation inside the conflict zone. So we don't know what's going on because nobody's allowed. And just uh, European Union sent monitors from uh, uh, internal uh, Georgian side just to monitor administrative border and for us it's important because if there are some provocations from the Russian side that somebody else also has a type of observation and we are thankful for that but they are unarmed just monitoring but the problem is it's not just Georgian problem because it's uh, credibility of EU institutions when uh, EU signed agreement also like guarantor and Russian side uh, is still in breach of this uh, agreement. It's a problem internationally, and uh, one should uh, I, I, one should uh, one may understand real politics, but uh, the problem is that uh, EU, of course, was very tough with Russia, but the Russia didn't pay uh, the price, and it wouldn't prevent it to then repeat this when they occupied annexed Crimea and then start a war, a military aggression in Donbas region of Ukraine. If Russia would have been prevented at that time, if Western countries, organizations were adequate to the problem which, uh, which uh, Russia evoked, then probably wouldn't have such problems in Ukraine when they went directly. This is first. So this agreement still is in breach. So one should put accountable Russia for not fulfillment of this agreement, at least to allow international monitors to visit the places and to be present there, and the second to withdraw its military uh, bases uh, to the pre-war uh, line. Second point is that um, uh, this year, uh, Georgia, after the, when uh, the war started, Georgia very soon, in just uh, four or five years, applied to international uh, courts. And one of them was Strasbourg Court of uh, the European Court of Human Rights. And after two, more than 12 years of hearings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, finally the Strasbourg Court uh, made a decision, issued the decision this year in January, saying that Russia violated interstate, uh, you know, uh, interstate. This was the case, interstate Georgia against Russia, uh, and uh, it was uh, that uh, the court recognized that Russia is in effect uh, is in charge of control of these territories. 
The only exception was made that the court said that during the military exercises, during the actual military conflict in August, uh, August 7 to uh, 12, it uh, could not uh, put the responsibility on Russia because it was not clear who was in control of these territories. But after August 12, when uh, there was a ceasefire and Russians took the actual control, the court said it took actual control of these conflict territories is outside of conflict territories. As Iraqi mentioned, they went beyond these conflict territories. And uh, the court put uh, responsibility on Russia's side of all the violations uh, or, or related to uh, European Commission of Human Rights, right to life, right to dignity, torture, uh, discrimination, uh, movement, freedom of movement, because Russians uh, promoted uh, ethnic cleansing, because all the Georgian villages were just burned down, and there are no Georgian villages anymore there, and so on and so on. So it, it was a quite legal recognition of Russia's responsibility. And even more, the court said that although it was difficult for uh, the court to say that during the conflicts, uh, military conflict, uh, the Russia was exactly the responsible, but it uh, obliged Russia to have effective investigation of uh, the atrocities uh, happening during the wartime. So it still opened the door for that. So it was uh, first international recognized, I, uh, I mean, uh, judicial decision, which says clearly who was responsible for the, all the atrocities during that time. Because many times the Russians claimed that, you know, with both sides in Georgia also were, you know, com were committing some crimes, etc., and the propaganda worked partly, at least in some of the circles of Western circles also. And but it was the first time when the Strasbourg Court made it uh, very uh, clear. And uh, in terms of international recognitions, also it was also that uh, the United States and European Union they uh, also played important role that other some other countries didn't recognize the independence. Uh, in spite of uh, the Russian influence and Russia, Russia was pushing very hard to persuade, even, even not bribing that, you know, giving some incentives to these countries or small countries in other regions in Africa or in Latin America or Asia, that let's recognize what, you know, it's, you are not neighbors, so what you lose, nothing. But uh, uh, the uh, active role of Georgian government, of course, uh, this was uh, prevented and almost no countries uh, recognized uh, legally as independent these countries, except uh, as mentioned, uh, Nicaragua, uh, Venezuela, uh, and recently Syria joined them. So uh, this was uh, actually what, uh, what else from a legal um, point of view. So, so this points that European Union brokered uh, uh, agreements, Sarkozy agreement, you know, the so-called, is uh, still pending, and <coughs> somebody should take responsibility. Uh, first of all, who brokered uh, this uh, deal? It was European Union, not Sarkozy personally. Mm -hmm. He's not in the position now to <laughs> control something, but uh, the European Union, yes. And the uh, second uh, decision of uh, the Strasbourg Court is also legally important. Uh, these two points. Yes. Maybe you have some questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, do I understand right that uh, in your position, you would say that if the West and European Union would have taken a harder stance on Russia during the uh, this conflict in 2008, that we might have not had the later problems uh, in Ukraine now in two starting 2014. Then, yes, absolutely, because you remember that. Uh... We have uh, the policy of reset, U.S. Uh, Russia, and also because of uh, uh, energy problems, uh, Europe tried to uh, have type of pragmatic approach, taking care of something like this, but uh, it didn't work. And um, so uh, Ukraine was next. And by the way, Georgian government won that time, and nobody took it seriously. And President Saakashvili really made a statement that next would be Ukraine. Uh, and other some other countries, and uh, so that's uh, that's a good example in a negative sense that uh, when there is no adequate uh, international reaction, uh, then um, other problems would come. So even uh, bigger headaches would come uh, to Western partners. So it's better to react adequately, and uh, uh, like Russia should be accountable for what has been done. 
in Georgia, in Ukraine now. And also another example is that um, sometimes some experts would say close to Russian uh, government saying that uh, if not the Georgian government who reacted to Russian aggression, maybe uh, the full scale war wouldn't happen. And maybe it's Georgians who are a bit energetic and maybe Saakashvili who was quite ambitious, etc. Maybe if not his uh, active role, uh, one would prevent this, uh, you know, provocation of Russian side. And, but Iraq already described that there was, was no choice. One choice is just to give up and to let Russian forces, but with the maybe umbrella of local forces, local proxies uh, that uh, to enter Georgian villages and then uh, to come to the capital or another was, or, or to or fight. And the Georgian government uh, decided to fight. And by the way, it's a very small, but uh, mobile uh, Georgian army could resist for four or five uh, days, uh, very big Russian forces without any air defense system, which was the big problem. And uh, so it showed that the Georgian army was quite, uh, which was trained uh, according to NATO rules, uh, was quite uh, active, but of course it was difficult to resist, uh, like a thing. Finns resisted for four or five months, the Russian troops, but uh, we could re resist for months with modern armaments. And uh, uh, so, uh, and the uh, Ukrainian, the Crimea case showed that when Ukraine didn't fight, but in Crimea, they took it just for two days and the reaction was uh, very like, you know, was the reaction was less because, you know, if you don't fight, nobody would uh, come to help you. But and when in Donbass, Ukrainians gave a very uh, tough uh, fight back to Russians then all the international community was mobilized, looking when they are fight for the independence, for the freedom, for democracy. All the friends would come to help you, but nobody would come instead of you if you don't fight, if you don't do anything, just quarreling the time small and I couldn't resist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to add uh, and continue on, on that um, point. I think that there are a few le lessons learned uh, from, from 2008. Uh, which uh, everyone should heed. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, not only Georgians, but also others as well. Uh, first of all, um, when there is such an act, such an aggress aggression coming from one of the players, you know, the response has to be adequate. If there is no adequate re response, if there, there, there are no costs imposed on the aggressor, what will happen is that this kind of actions are going to be repeated. So Georgia was the first victim. The next victim was um, Ukraine. And then, of course, we saw Russia flexing muscle beyond that. They did this in Syria. Then they, what they did was that they were trying to uh, influence elections in the um, United States. They did intervene there. They did the same you know, in Germany when they were uh, trying to influence the elections there. Also in France, by the way. And, and nowadays, you know, everyone understands that you know, Russian is able, Russia is able to... Uh, go forward with its influence operations, you know, beyond their territories, you know, and the extraterritorial application of Russian state power is, is, is now a fact of life. The, you, you know what they did to on the UK soil, you know, with the um, different types of poisonings, um, you know, and the use of polonium and many other things. So this is a state, this is an act of state aggression. Okay, sometimes you do it through different means. So Georgia was basically a first example. When they did something and uh, there was a muted and very weak, uh, very weak response from the international community, unfortunately, Russians were not given a very clear sign and message that they did something very, very bad. That's why the Crimea happened. That's why there is still a war in the east of Ukraine and uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. And that's why the West is trying to cope right now still with the problems which are caused by Russians. So when there is an aggression, the, this has to be a very clear cost imposed on the aggressor. Um, international community has to be un united. I mean, the free world has to be united. There shouldn't be kind of a mix of messages. Everyone should stand behind and have that in mind. The other thing, uh, the other lesson I think, uh, which we have learned is that always plan for the worst case scenario, okay? 
So you always have have to plan for the worst case scenario. There are no honeymoons in the international security. Uh, so you always have to be tough and ready, no matter if you are a neutral country or not, no matter if you perceive yourself to be like that, if you don't take into see your security seriously, no one else will. People don't like um, those actors, those people who don't act. You have to act, you have to be ready for the worst case scenario. The third lesson, I think, is that uh, the internal cohesion inside and the resilience of society is extremely important. There should be a consensus, a nationwide consensus about certain values. For example, your territorial integrity, our territorial integrity, uh, the national security, no, it, it, it shouldn't be only part of the national security, security uh, uh, officials or the decision makers, but the whole of society has to understand that the resilience of repelling an aggressor is an important value for your state, for the statehood. So these are the lessons actually which um, should be learned from this. Uh, sometimes um, these lessons are there. We don't want to listen to them. We don't want to take them into account. But our example has shown that it's extremely important to move forward with this um, in, in, in the future and in the present. Hmm. It's, it's very, very interesting. Like, because often, like, especially, well, I mean, Finland, especially, like, as a country part of EU, as a country that is part of the EU, uh, so obviously we follow a lot of EU politics and in EU politics this is always a kind of a talking point especially with the Western European countries like I for example I reside na right now in Netherlands and Netherlands is a big congestion point like is it worth to uh, invest in uh, military and like what kind of a posture should uh, the Western European countries take on the world sh world stage and things like this but as we can see from your your experiences of the Georgian experience, if if you don't take this thing seriously, indeed, then also nobody else will. Absolutely, you know, many people think that you know, but sometimes just having a gun is not enough, you know. So it's not only about the hard uh, power assets, you know. It's also about to know how to use them because if if mm -hmm. if, if there is someone you know intruding in uh, your uh, house, you know, you only you don't only have to have the uh, the gun in your hands to defend yourself, but you also have to know how to use this gun. So that's why you know defense and uh, defense and planning is extremely important because you know you have to be ready for all types of developments. Um, so you know I always would like to use uh, the phrase from the, the former president of the United States Eisenhower, who said that the plan is nothing; the planning is everything. Okay, so it's not the plan itself, but the planning, the process. So if you're not ready, you know, you have, if you haven't run through the, the these different scenarios and if you haven't used your, um, you know, uh, peace time, I mean, the peace time for preparing when the time comes, you know, it's always late. It is always late. So uh, if people don't understand why, 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 why they have to have 2% uh, uh, funding of their military, for example, like inside NATO, there is a huge talk about why should we be using the 2% of our GDP for it. But yeah, I, of course, there are different priorities. Different governments have uh, different priorities. But um, it, you cannot take for, I mean, um, I mean, uh, I, I don't know, like, uh, you, you definitely should take these things serious, seriously. You know, if you don't take it seriously, uh, when the time comes, it's always late. So, yeah, that is right. This is very, very interesting, because in my point of view, we are at the moment talking about the concept of warfare in modern circumstances. And beforehand, in our podcast, we have uh, interviewed... Uh, Swedish uh, military experts who have this very traditional Clausewitzian uh, point of view and uh, perspective on warfare. But nowadays, as these soft measures, uh, we talk about hybrid warfare, we talk about Russia and different actors trying to find institutional weaknesses, trying to find these uh, divisions inside uh, countries and pushing on those, destabilization. Uh, so as a Finnish person and as a history enthusiast, 
I hear you say that these things are the main focuses of modern conflict and these things should be taken seriously. You should not just uh, uh, take it as uh, uh, nothing when a foreign country is investing in your politics, uh, buying your crucial inf infrastructure and uh, trying to flame up conflict uh, between different ethnic minorities inside of your sovereign territory. These are things that eventually lead up to kinetic conflicts and should be dealt as soon as possible before some actual human suffering and uh, loss of life is involved. Absolutely. I'm, um, I mean, the one thing, you know, you, you named uh, Swedes and uh, the Swedes have uh, been very much interested about the experience of Georgians. And they've been uh, visiting Georgia and learning the, the, um, the lessons of the 2008 war. Um, and they're taking it pretty seriously. I know that Finland and Sweden, you know, you are not NATO members, you know, you have a very different idea of how you should defend yourself and the security. But I know that things are changing in Sweden. I know that the support for the uh, NATO membership is increasing. You know, um, there is a bit of a different in dynamic in Finland, but I know that the discussions have started. There are different ways of how, to, how, how you see uh, the doctrinal part of the defense and the security, providing security to your country. But one way or another, now everyone understands that in the globalized world, no one is safe right now. No one is safe. Why? Because, it, as you said, you know, uh, it's not only about kinetic war. You know, the, the conventional warfare has become um, obsolete in many ways. Why? Because there are so many other uh, means uh, and methods to uh, to incur costs on on the um, uh, on your uh, rival. You know, Russians right now, Russians are weaponizing migrants, people. They're weaponizing migrants very close to your border. Um, they're weaponizing um, uh, migrants. They have shipped migrants uh, to Belarus, and the and the migrants, the Syrian migrants, are right now trying to storm the the Polish border. You know, who would have thought about weaponizing the migrants? Who would have thought that you know information can be weaponized? You know, the way they have weaponized and flared up tensions inside U.S. You know, with the racial problems being you know for uh, as as you as you mentioned, you know, they find the frictions inside the society and they are trying to increase and uh, the, the the create the bigger risks of of these threats being realized. So. That, that's that's how it's going to be done. So the societal resilience, the vigilance, and uh, understanding that the problems are always there, and you should be dealing with these problems, you know, uh, in advance and taking it to, I mean, seriously those things. I, th I think going to be uh, the new way of conducting wars, and then and and we have to live with this. Um, we, we live in a world where one person can write something here in Tbilisi and can influence what is happening in Finland, for sure. You know, and nothing can stop it. You know, the the the, the net can can stop it. You know, it's going to be uh, very difficult to uh, um, stop it if you don't if if you are not resilient enough. So that's that's the new way of conducting wars, and Russia is using it. Not only Russia, there are other actors as well. You know, China is doing that. Um, you know, in a different theater of war, in a different uh, combat phases, but everyone is doing it now. You know, Russians call it non-linear warfare. So nonlinear warfare means that, you know, it's not only about kinetics, you know, it's not only about art security, you know, Chinese call it unrestri uh, unrestricted warfare. Their doctrine, that's the same thing, but they, they call it a different thing. Okay, so they have different schools. Um, so in, in modern uh, world, you know, people have to be paying attention to this, especially the ones who are decision makers. Leaders have to lead, they don't have to follow because most of the times leaders nowadays don't lead anymore. They are just following what the, the, I don't know, like some segments of society say, of course that's important, but the leaders should be able to stand uh, firm on what is important for the statehood and, and for, for the society. That might be also a side effect of the new phenomenon of this career politician uh, in yeah. Western Values society. are secondary. They, they are. Values have yeah, become yeah. secondary, um, and and I, I do think that that's a that's a that's a huge problem nowadays. You know, uh, it's a problem here in Georgia, but not only in Georgia. You know, I see that, that the similar problems are elsewhere as well in, in in the consolidated democracies, where unfortunately people have abandoned leadership. 
um, you know, um, managing your country according to the uh, uh, opinion surveys. Well, it's important, but it shouldn't become the new prime. You know, it shouldn't be the prime concern. Of course, you have to be concerned with it because you want to be elected. But there are other ways uh, you, you should be trying to score uh, your political uh, uh, points, you know, and accumulate political capital. Hmm. All right. This, this has been indeed very, very, very interesting, I think, for us and all of the listeners also. But I think uh, we've now had one hour and 20 minutes. We're going to have to slowly start to approach to the end at some point. Uh, but before we end, uh, Mr. Kwapashvili and Mr. Borjitsa, how do you see the future of Georgian uh, security politics and by extension also the security politics in the whole Caucasus region developing in the future years? Oh, it's another like serious topic. We need another podcast. <laughs> shortly, <laughs> shortly, shortly. Shortly, as a lawyer, because I, as I can add something, but you know, may uh, you know uh, provide more details. Maybe it's his subject also. Uh, but uh, the, the one uh, one uh, is uh, clear, and it's also, by the way, is written in our constitution that Georgia has a Western aspiration, and it should follow this path. And primary goal should be to join the NATO, even with, uh, with uh, these uh, problems. I, uh, we know that it's a, it's a huge challenge. And uh, some of our big Western countries are not so much ready to take a country with problems. But uh, also it's mutual, mutual, like, you know, uh, it should be uh, based on mutual interest. Because Georgia still remains in one of the first post of democracy in the region. And if uh, uh, Georgia loses, this means that the whole region would uh, give up for a long, long time, maybe for a century. It's a pessimistic scenario, but uh, I would prefer to be more optimistic. And uh, Georgia should uh, uh, go to the um, path developing as a model country in terms of democracy, economic growth, and to show to the whole region that if you follow Western values, Western practices, this here is the country. So uh, to be, become more and more attractive for everybody, including for Georgian citizens living in, uh, in um, uh, separatist regions. Now, even for them, it should be attractive and for all neighbors. And another one is that uh, to be ready that when international uh, context is changed and not now it's not the best context because there are a lot of problems in the world in the region and georgia is not the priority unfortunately now and uh but to be ready that when once uh the attention would be much more here but it depends also on georgia how it would uh, pre uh, present itself to the whole world and uh, to be ready that uh, to take responsibility and uh, to be part of europe and to prove that it deserves this and with our international friends uh, from Western countries and from NATO, European Union, we would uh, tackle with all these problems peacefully, but um, persistent. This is very, very short. Um, I, I, I do agree on um, the, the points that uh, was uh, raised by um, Professor Prafuashvili. Uh, I would add that, you know, um, it is really an unfortunate development that uh, the West has been more or less disengaged from the region. And uh, we don't see the, the, the U.S. interest that was uh, quite, quite there for quite some time. Uh, we also don't see uh, the EU as being as interested as it was. And there are a lot of inertia um, processes taking place and developments are very inertia uh, related. But I think that uh, one thing that I would desire is that for the, uh, the, the, the Western opinion makers to think strategically about the region. Um, to uh, be serious about democracy in the region, because uh, if 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 we see the the uh, continuous degradation and continu continuous diminishing uh, trend of uh, democratization in the region and beyond, um, I think that's going to be a very bad signal to the countries that that want to continue to be democratic in the region where. Um, the currency of democracy hasn't been really, really, really very high. 
and the value has been diminishing. So I think that people have to take it seriously. From other strategic uh, points of view, I think um, they have to understand that there are, if you disengage, there are others who are going to be feeling in the vacuum. So in the region, these are going to be, of course, Russians, um, Chinese are also interested. Iran has its own interests. Turkey has, uh, even though it's a, a NATO country and is an ally of Georgia, um, you know, has also some ambitions and some interests. So coordinating that with the inside NATO among the allies is also extremely important. So I think this strategic thinking should prevail in the major uh, capitals. I think we have the same problem here. Our government is unfortunately a very weak government these days, which doesn't really think strategically. It doesn't think strategically about defending its vital interests. It always thinks that, you know, to be muted to certain problems that are caused by Russia is okay because they want to balance. Uh, but they don't understand that, you know, for Russians, it's a zero sum game, you know, it's not a win-win. So the more you don't talk about your problems and the more you don't defend your vital interests, the more is going to be demanded and the more is going to be asked of you. So we have to learn how to be a better defenders of our interests. We have to have better army. We have to take it seriously that there are huge Russian intelligence networks inside Georgia who are trying to influence the local turf. Uh, we have to be resilient as a society. We have to take information warfare seriously. We have to have a better economy. We have to have a healthier economy. Um, and all of that is extremely important. But nowadays, it's unfortunate that Georgia is in a political crisis where um, the government is using, the, the party in power is using every means it has, and there is a huge uh, resource disparity, to overpower opposition. And that's their major concern, not other vital interests that the country should have. And our democracy is, is uh, unfortunately, the degree of our democracy is diminishing. And it's a very bad sign because others are not going to be paying attention to Georgia. So the more we become less democratic, there is going to be a less interest paid to us. So there are strategic considerations. The external wars are exogenous ones. And there are, of course, internal ones that I've been talking about. But in both ways, I think we need leaders with who think strategically, who are able to um, create the proper drivers. Um, so it's not, it's going to be hard times ahead of us. You know, uh, we live in a poly problem world. You know, there's too many problems. Resources are very, very, very tight. So we have to be learning to survive in the tough conditions. You know, as in special force trainings, you know, you are getting ready for the times when you know, uh, you won't be able to sleep for six hours or eight hours and you, you have to survive, you know, in difficult conditions. I think every state should understand that the times that are going to be coming with different types of pandemic or different types of problems that we're going to be facing, we have to get used to be a resilient entities. So leaders should be thinking about this in the years to come. And I think that's the, that's the historical lesson we should be learning. In many ways, I can see relatable concepts and talking points to many <coughs> Northern European nations like Finland, for example. Same uh, phenomenons, maybe different magnitude and different... Uh, uh, context. Different contexts, but still the, in many ways same. Yes. Well, I... Um... I think uh, this is now seems like a good time to start uh, start to wrap up and um, yeah I would uh, I would uh, invite you if you still have some some points that uh, you might have not been able to raise during this interview uh, to maybe present them now. Uh, well, and, uh, also after after we wrap up, uh, I would like to invite you to have a small after conversation because after this recording uh, we will 
record or uh, produce this Finnish uh, language uh, episode about the Russia Church and conflict in 2008. And if you have some points you want to uh, bring about that we we take into account in that one, that's yeah. also <laughs> yeah. something we but would be interested But only if you have time, because we yeah. understand you are very busy men yes, both. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, one thing I, I would personally be uh, fine to be, I mean, welcoming is that uh, to equate as much as possible the problems that, uh, I mean, frankly speaking, you know, even though you are a member of EU and even though uh, you have a very different context, maybe, I still think that there are many things that are pretty comparable. You are bordering Russia, um, you know, uh, you had the same problem, which is a territorial problem. You lost 8% of your territory, you know, Karelia and uh, the areas uh, around the Ladoga Lake. I mean, and all those problems. Georgia is experiencing these things now. So I think uh, the, the more you make, I mean, once you are trying to kind of have your uh, preview uh, in place, please make those and equate those uh, examples because it's going to be very easy for your uh, viewers or listeners to understand this. You lost 8% 8, 8 of our of your territories. We are, our 20% of our territory is under occupation right now. You know, 20% of our, and we are in, in a survival mode still because Russia is actively trying to uh, commit uh, acts of aggression against us. So these are extremely important. And, and also, um, you know, I know that you pay a lot of attention uh, to the trade with Russia, you know, and it has, it has become sometimes a, a, a factor which influences your policy towards Russia, well, which is, which has merits, of course. But I, I do think that, you know, it's vital to understand that the vital interests of your country, the influence-free environment is more important than getting uh, two times more bread or two times more, um, you know, material gain. Because in the end, you know, there, there is always going to be a pi uh, price to pay. Always there is going to be a uh, price to pay and the values are important. I don't know, I think I made it clear. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer, but otherwise. All right, Professor Papuashvili and Professor Pozhitse would like to very much thank you for this amazing interview. It has been very, very informative. And I think all of our listeners also learned at least the dozen new things about this conflict and about the geopolitical situation of Georgia. Ville, uh, hello. Ville, uh, would you want to add something? Well, overall, it's been an honor. It's been extremely interesting. And it's kind of a shame to end it at this point. I, I believe we could have talked through the night about these subjects. They are big subjects with uh, lots of lots of different point of views and different uh, ways to open it up more. But overall, uh, I'd like to thank you for this interview. And uh, uh, yeah. After, after we wrap this up, uh, there is still a couple of points I would like to discuss, discuss with you uh, after, after the recording. Okay. Uh, recording the, recording the uh, Finnish episode prelude for this interview that we are going to produce. Okay, thank you. Thank you.